The study of demography was actually begun by insurance professionals who wanted to know when it was most likely that somebody would pass away or when it was most likely that they would have children and at what risks is each age category. And it is in those type of questions that we'll be asking questions about survival patterns and demography. The objectives here define, of course, demography, fecundity, survivorship curves, what is a cohort, and what are the differences between semel parity and iteral parity. Be able to create a life table and be able to draw the three different types of survivorship curves. Last, compare semel parity and iteral parity and be able to give examples. So demography. It's a study of vital statistics and how they change in a population over time. Vital statistics such as death rate, birth rate, age class structure, that's another lecture, sex ratio, generally one to one, and fecundity, the number of offspring per female. So the death rate is of special interest to insurance providers. At which ages is there the greatest risk of death? And those ages, if they're purchasing life insurance, should be charged at a higher rate because they're purchasing it and it's unlikely that it will pay dividends for the life insurance company. And one way to study this is to use a cohort. You may be familiar with the term cohort. It's a group of college students that start college at the same time. And when they're starting at the same time, we can track these college students and see what is the attrition rate of college students each year and what is the um, progression through school. So we can actually trap a cohort together. It can be used as a group of a group just of individuals born at the same time, so from the same nesting season or what have you. And there's actually this famous nurses study in Britain where they measured a cohort of babies all born in the same hospital during the same year. And this has been an ongoing study for quite some years. And you can measure their um, vital statistics as they are all at the same age. We would take those statistics and compile them into a life table. Life table is going to give the data on those individuals alive in each single age class, <coughs> as well as the <coughs> reproductive output of those individuals. So you're going to put them in either years, months, days, minutes, depending on what type of organism you're looking at. So the first thing you'll be calculating is n sub x. I didn't use the sub x in the note because all of them are going to have sub x and you don't do subheadings in the notes on the screen. It just hasn't worked well for me. And you know, n sub x. So the age of years is x. So for each one of these, is n sub 1 is the, uh, the number alive at the, at the start of year 1. So that's the whole cohort. Every baby pup, um, think about this in terms of beavers, perhaps. So there's a picture of a beaver right behind me. I forgot to move it before starting this lecture. Oh, well, that's beaver. So you have uh, 3,000 beavers alive at the beginning of year x. Then we next measure how many die during that year. d sub x, so the number that are passing away. So that's going to um, tell us what the age-specific mortality is. So for beavers, about half of them are dying in the first year. So that's not a good thing, but there's often this youth-specific mortality of mammals, and they're more susceptible to um, predation when they're younger. We take this death statistic and use it to calculate something called l sub x. And that L sub X is a proportion alive at the start of the year. It's always going to be 1 for L. So L sub 1 is going to be 1. L sub 2 is going to tell you what proportion actually makes it through their first year and starts year 2. So that's what L sub X will do is tell you what proportion is living. It can never go up. It is only going down. And when L sub X is 0, you should have stopped measuring a year ago. Then there's... M sub X. And the M is the age specific fertility. So one year old beavers do not produce any offspring. That's okay. And they produce more offspring as they get older, but they peak around, it looks like uh, looks like years eight to nine or so. That's when they peak. 
and then they kind of decrease as they uh, they get even older. So very specific at, uh, fertility for each year. Uh, think of this in terms of uh, trees. They may not be producing seeds for the first five years. Think of it in terms of um, oh, squash plants, and they may be producing seeds for the first, oh, say, two months, months, years, whatever. And then we have this, this thing in the end here called L sub X, M sub X. And what you're doing there is you're multiplying the proportion alive with the age-specific fecundity. And these numbers are highest when there is the, uh, the highest fertility. So there's a certain, it's always going to be decrease, it's going to decrease after that age of fertility gets at its highest, of course, because it's being multiplied by a smaller number as these get older and a smaller number as more of them die out. The sum of all those L sub X, M sub X will tell you how well a cohort is replacing itself, really. So how, well, do they stay alive long enough to reach their maximum fertility? And do enough stay alive to have enough fertility to essentially re replace themselves. And you may note that L sub X and M sub X are, are unitless, really. Whereas the number alive and number dying are, um, they have units. You cancel those units out when you get the L sub X, M sub X. So the net reproductive rate is a unitless thing known as R0. We'll get to that later. Not this lecture, but a different one. And you can use these to create uh, survivorship curves too. So if you were to look at the, uh, log scale of the number that survive, you can start calculating how fast they die off, and you can kind of make a curve on that. So for beavers, you can see it's a straight line on a logarithmic scale. Roughly half of them are dying off about every year. For this uh, Belding's ground squirrels, there's actually different survivorship curves to the males and the females. Females live longer than males, and that's shown by the males dying off at age five years. Most of them have died off on this uh, logarithmic scale, and that's one of these life strategies, really. There are different types of curves for different organisms. Sorry, it's one. Type, written a different way, one. So type one survivorship curves are going to be low mortality of juveniles, high mortality in the oldest individuals. So good care of offspring is going to lead to most individuals dying much later in life. So this was actually a study done. So should we, uh, should we stop wolves from eating these bighorn sheep? So we hunt the wolves. And what happened was they collected the skulls of these wolves, of these uh, sheep, and they see how old they are when they die. So they could use this age at death to determine um, what proportion was dying at each age. And what they found was age specifically, most of them were dying when they got um, much older. So the age specific mortality, um, much younger, sorry, number of survivors, number of deaths. You can actually look at this a bit. Realistically, yeah, number alive. Actually, yeah. So over half of them alive till six to seven years. Sorry, make sure I was reading that right. So the number alive. Oh, it's, yeah, older. Sorry, I was reading the graph wrong. Okay, yeah, it's way older. So it's the uh, it's the 10, 12 to thirteen and thirteen to fourteen. There are barely any alive, but looking, they most of them are going to survive at least seven years. There we go. So at least most of them would survive at least seven years, and they have uh, if they have fecundity at under age seven, then they're probably replacing themselves just fine. So. The wolves, well, what do the wolves prey on? They prey on the youngest sheep and the oldest sheep. Okay, are the wolves causing enough of a threat to actually change the sheep population? The answer is no. The most sheep are actually going to make it to age seven or even age eight. So if most of the sheep are making it to age seven or eight, they're, they're having enough offspring to replace themselves. And that's this type one survivorship curve for the sheep. Now, if it was a type 3 survivorship curve that we saw, it would seem that there's a vast mortality of the young, and that would be a reason to cull the wolves. But as it was, there's no good reason to it because they're not actually damaging the uh, mountain goats, mountain sheep. Type 2, relatively uniform death rate. Like passerine birds. Passerine birds tend to die, about half of them die every year. Uh, the beavers have a relatively uniform death rate, and the Belding's ground squirrels had a relatively uniform death rate. Basically, 
every single year is just as risky as every other year. So there isn't a, an age specific like high risk time. So for a type one individual living long, uh, if they start going to funerals of their cohort, they can be confident that they'll soon be attending their own funeral of their cohort. It's a risky time to be alive when you're very old. With type two, it's always the same amount of risky to be alive. So yay, the risk is always present. Whereas type three, riskiest for the young. This is really the case of, well, you think of it weeds in your garden. So let's say you are an avid weeder. You really try to get rid of every weed as it pops up. Just like Sheriff John Brown, you say kill it before it grows. I say kill it before it grows. So there's a high mortality very early on, but once they get established, they survive well. So this is occasionally the case in my own garden where if a weed can grow underneath a much larger plant, by the time I notice it, it's already starting to set seeds. So that's when they can be successful. But mortality is very high for juveniles. This is very true for most plants, really. So most plants are going to have a lot of seeds that they give out. Most of them don't make it to a year. If you watch the, um, the sprouts of maple trees, you'll see the sprouts of these maple trees coming up everywhere on campus. And then the next, and then during the winter, um, they're all dead. They don't make it past their first winter most often. They get eaten by deer during the year. They get sun scorched during the summer. They get trampled by students or they just um, get frozen to death in the winter. So some live though. And for the ones that live, okay, will they make it their next year? Well, not many make it their next year. But if they make it about 10 years, if one of those maple trees makes it for about 10 years, it probably has enough of a presence in the ground that it won't have a drought problem. It's grown out of the reach of deers. No students are going to uh, step on it except from our, our, our um, Brobden Nagian exchange students. Going for joke for the win. So there's no one's going to destroy type three once it gets a certain age and they can live a very long time. So really this idea of once it gets established, they're fine almost forever. Human populations are somewhere between a type two and type three, a type two and type one, sorry. They're somewhere between those. And actually it depends on healthcare. So Canadian healthcare is pretty good, eh? So I give an A plus. So the proportion surviving to a longer age is much higher than healthcare in Mexico. So healthcare in Mexico is uh, not as good and they have a, a life curve that is a little bit closer to, but not really a type two. Still, being old is going to be your highest risk for humans, and we're, we are generally more a type one, but if you see the curve moving towards a type two, it generally means that there is um, a lot of disease in the population. If you were to check out the U.S. healthcare and compare it to the U.S. healthcare um, expenses, you know what? You deserve a, a good life. Don't look at that. I've got to actually let a cat in here. She's scratching at the door, but I'm too far into the lecture to stop. Yes! You know what? Hold on just a sec. Oh, now she's gone. She knew I was going to use her as an example. Cats. Where do you think cats are on this uh, life scale? Do you think the risk is highest as kittens or the risk is highest when they're oldest? Is domestic cat different than a uh, feral cat? Go look it up. There can be variation within these survival strategies depending on life changes. So there's uh, these katydids, and if they become inflated, they just basically poof out their bodies. And if they're inflated, they can attract females. So here we have a, uh, a male of a small male, uninflated, and then we have an inflated male, the one that looks really puffy like, and then uh, the females in the middle there, kind of choosing between inflated or uninflated. Well, she'll probably prefer the, uh, the inflated because he's cuter. But what's interesting is the uninflated can live up to 95 days, whereas the inflated die before 70 days. Why? Well, predation. They're easier to find if they're inflated, but they can live longer if they're not. So it's a choice, life or sex. Well, the, infl the uninflated males sometimes just get sneaky, so they get both, but it's not the best strategy. So there's selection for not doing that. All right, speaking of reproduction, two reproductive strategies. I mean, there are more, but these are two along a, along a gradient of when offspring are produced. So this is the MX.
when an organism produces offspring is really going to be, it's a, it's a lifestyle strategy and choice. So if an organism can gain resources for a hundred years and then can produce many offspring in one big boom, it can produce a lot of offspring. It's known as stemmel parity. One shot, but oh, what a shot. They can reproduce and they put all of their resources, hold nothing back, into seeds. It's a good choice. Uh, salmon, most salmon use this. They swim upstream, they put all their resources into offspring. Good. There's also iteroparity. So iteroparity puts less resources into each reproduction, but has more reproductions. So few offspring, many times in life. So this can be continuous, uh, seasonal. In seasonal, you're going to see these, you know, little notches of when they are going to be producing offspring, just in a certain sequence. Every every spring, they lay, lay eggs. Or it can be continuous, where when they can, they do. When they can't, they don't. And they will be able to have offspring more than once, but continuously throughout their lives. So these are different strategies, and there's actually more of a gradient kind of between them. Um, you can produce more or fewer offspring, and it actually decreases the lifespan to produce more offspring, too. So MX comes out of trading of LX, especially in semel parity, where no offspring are had until the very end. And most semel parous organisms have a type 3 lifestyle curve.